Hi, everybody. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Podcast 2.0, the new era of the show formerly known as the Blonde Files Podcast. By now, if you're here, then you probably saw the new cover, the new name, same show, new name. We're just elevating. We're growing up together. We are going to the next level. So today I am going to do a solo episode. I'm going to talk a little bit about the rebrand just from the top so that you guys know what to expect. And I have Ashley, my producer, who has been my producer for at least the last year, I think. The woman behind the show. She's going to be asking the questions today. Hi, Ashley. Hey, Aria. How are you? (laughs) I'm so happy that you're on mic. I'm looking at the wrong place, though, everybody on YouTube. I'm going to look back at the poll. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay, Ariel. So why whale? Why this rebrand? If people have been listening to my show for a long time, which I think a lot of people listening today have been, then they probably know that I have been talking about at least changing the name of the podcast for years. I signed with Dear Media when I had been doing the podcast for a year. And I want to say about six months into that, I started thinking about changing the name. A little backstory is that I started my Instagram account anonymously in 2016. My pseudonym was The Blonde Files. And I just used that for everything. My website was The Blonde Files. My Instagram was The Blonde Files. So when it came time to do a podcast in 2019, I was like, The Blonde Files, not thinking that it would turn into anything And it obviously really had no meaning. And as the show has grown, I have really felt like the name doesn't reflect the content of the show. And I feel like the name doesn't reflect the substance of the show. And I just feel like I personally have grown up so much and so many of the listeners have grown up with me, watched me go through so many different phases of my life and the listeners are growing too. And I think we're growing in understanding and I've crowdsourced over the years ideas for a new name. And whenever I ask people, what do you think of when you think of the podcast? It's always wellness, this wellness, that. And I think that wellness has kind of a bad connotation lately. So with well, I kind of want each of us to just figure out what it means to be well for ourselves. My definition of what it means to be well is really being flexible, being adaptable, being attuned to myself enough that I can find what feels good for me and what works for me in the moment. Have fun. You know, I remember I had a guest on my show a couple years ago. I can't remember her name. And she was talking about this concept of wellness and being well and being healthy despite the state of our body and how it's more of a mindset thing. And I think that we're in this time where everybody is trying to biohack everything, optimize everything, seek out perfect health, perfect sleep, perfect balanced hormones, perfect blood sugar, perfect nutrition, whatever it is. And I feel like that is so much pressure. And then I think that When you're reliant on that for your state of being, it's going to be very turbulent. So I think that taking a step back and finding how you can be well despite circumstances, that's like really what I am exploring for myself. And I'm going to have the same kind of experts and guests and people with experience in whatever field on the show. And through these conversations, the listeners then will be equipped with all the information that they need to define what it means to be well for themselves. That is beautiful. Thanks. Seriously. And since working with you for the past year, I can even see your growth. So it sounds like you're saying this is going to be a newer, better version of yourself, of your podcast and all of it. So that's beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Newer, better, still the same, but, you know, refined in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're just growing. We're evolving. We're leveling up. We're having fun, most importantly. Yeah. A lot of fun. Mm hmm. Okay, so we're going to get into the listener questions. They have a lot of interesting things to to ask you. You've been on your journey and we just want to hear more from you. So what are you struggling with these days in all areas of your life? I actually love this question. And it's a question that I like to ask my guests sometimes at the top of the show, because I think that we see glimpses of people's lives and especially on social media, we see the highlight reel 
And we forget that despite how people's lives look on the outside, they are struggling with things. And it's a pretty universal thing. I don't know anybody who's not struggling with anything (laughs) ever. So with me, I think that you guys have been with me on this journey the last year. I have talked ad nauseum about how difficult last year was between the health issues, the Botox thing, the unraveling of the marriage, the divorce. And then on the other side of that has been this year that has been so incredible, so fulfilling in so many ways, better than I ever could have imagined for myself. And (laughs) at the same time, I have been dealing with things that I didn't necessarily deal with before. I think that leaving the relationship that I was in, leaving the security of that relationship in a lot of ways, taking on so many more responsibilities. And then also on top of that, being in a new relationship. I mean, it's been seven months at this point, but newish relationship, traveling nonstop, which is what I wanted to do rebranding, changes with work, all of these things, I just have felt like I've had more on my plate than ever before. And I didn't even realize it. So I didn't realize the level to which I had all of the minutia (laughs) taken care of for me when I was married and all of the responsibilities taken care of for me when I was married. You know, I really only had to worry about myself and getting my work done, but that was it. And suddenly when I got divorced and moved out, I mean, there is so much bullshit (laughs) to deal with on a day to day basis. And everyone listening is like, yeah, we know. But it just adds this pressure, at least for me, on top of everything else. And I'm also struggling with self-imposed pressure and some perfectionism things and just finding ways to not get so overwhelmed. That's kind of my go-to is to feel overwhelmed, even when it's all really good stuff. And then I start to lose perspective a little bit. And I get that narrative of like, oh, I have to do this. I have to do that da, 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 all day. And then I take a step back and I'm like, no, I get to do this. As cliche as it sounds, this life that I am living right now, it's a life that I would have only been able to dream of definitely before I got sober. But even in those really hard days and to be totally honest, like the last couple of years of my marriage, this was my dream. And yet (laughs) it's a lot. It's hard. And I do know somebody asked because I saw these questions before. I'm just going to jump into it because it's relevant here. But somebody asked, am I less anxious now that I'm in love? And I was like, no, I'm way more anxious. (laughs) I'm way more anxious this year than I have ever been. And I think that there are a few variables that contribute to that. One, the predominant symptom of the Botox poisoning, whatever you want to call it, was panic, 24-7 panic. And that subsided as the Botox wore off. It's been exactly a year. Last weekend, it was exactly a year. But ever since then, it's like my nervous system has been so much more fragile than it ever was before. And for no rhyme or reason, some days I wake up and I am just so anxious. It's debilitating sometimes. So I've been working with a therapist and I do all of my wellnessy things to help assuage some of that anxiety, but it's weird and I have not been able to get to the bottom of it. So it's like, I don't really know what this person meant with the correlation being in love and being less anxious. (laughs) Maybe the person who asked the question meant because I don't have that turmoil anymore that I'm living with on a daily basis of like, should I stay? Should I go? Just that emotional turmoil that I felt before I got divorced. But no, it's like two things are true. Yes, I'm in love. I'm so happy, not just in the relationship in so many aspects of my life. And (laughs) the anxiety has been a beast this year. And... I'm learning how to navigate like life on my own, even though I'm in a relationship, like I am on my own. I have all of these responsibilities that I didn't necessarily have before and trying to manage like my friendships, my relationships with my family, my recovery life, my health stuff, my romantic relationship, my job, you know, it's a lot, but everyone listening can relate. I know. Yeah, of course. (laughs) You're balancing it all. And speaking of some of the health stuff, uh, 
one of your questions is, what's your fitness routine and foods you eat to beat bloat and remain slim? What do you think my fitness routine is? (laughs) I feel like I get asked this question in every episode and I give the worst answer that nobody wants to hear. I think we've talked about a couple of things before, though. Did you tell me you go to tennis? I was going to tennis. (laughs) Yes, I was getting really into tennis. And then with the traveling the last month, month and a half, I've been really inconsistent. But another thing, not to be like Debbie Downer and keep talking about the Botox thing, but ever since that happened, I can't really work out. It's the weirdest thing. It's not because of my strength. It's because I get symptomatic after I work out. And then it's also really, really difficult for me to recover. Like if I do any kind of hard workout, it takes me out for like five days. So I did actually (laughs) go see a doctor about it yesterday. Actually, the rheumatologist who I saw when I first was dealing with the Botox stuff, he wanted to test a few things and see if there's anything going on there. But that said, so many people have asked about my fitness routine. And I do remember talking about this on another episode. So sorry if I am repeating myself. But when all of that happened, I lost a lot of weight because I just couldn't eat. And then when I got better, I eat the same amount that I used to eat. But I think I'm just a little bit thinner than I was, not by much, maybe by a few pounds. And then with the stress of the divorce and everything, I don't know. I mean, I think that I lost a little bit of weight. And it's so interesting how people validate that (laughs) on social media. And I do remember sometimes last year posting pictures and people were like, oh, my God, your body looks amazing. What are you doing? And everyone wants to know the fitness and nutrition details. And I was like, oh, I just feel like I'm fucking dying and I can't eat. (laughs) You know, like you never know what's going on with somebody. So it's flattering, but also maybe sometimes like not something that you want to comment on necessarily, even when it is a compliment. So that said, my diet and workout routine is kind of non-existent right now. I do try to dabble in things. I do enjoy tennis. That's something that I can do without getting the vertigo and all of the symptoms again. And I do walk a lot. I mean, especially traveling, like nonstop walking. And occasionally I'll do like a light Pilates or something like that. But pretty much for the last year, it's been non-existent except for sporadic workouts here and there. And it's like what nobody wants to hear. And I probably sound so obnoxious. It's genetics. <laughs> it's literally lucky you. <laughs> genetic. I don't want to be that girl. You're right. But it's like, I think that there's this blind spot in the wellness and the fitness worlds where, yes, you can work out, you can eat a certain way, you can manipulate how your body looks. But I think at the end of the day, like a lot of it is genetic. And I say this all the time, but everyone in my family is very small and kind of lean. And when I don't work out, I'm the type of person with who, when I work out, I don't get bulky, but I get muscular pretty quickly. And when I don't work out, that muscle atrophies <laughs> and then I just look skinnier. So when I'm not working out, people think I am doing something different. And then as far as my diet and my nutrition, it's been shit. It's been eating out constantly, traveling, eating whatever. I did have this major stomach issue, which I've talked about on Patreon so much when I was traveling in Europe. And that was another thing. I couldn't eat for like seven weeks. And everyone's like, you look amazing. (laughs) It's like, thanks. (laughs) But got that figured out. Shout out to Dr. Mao. Tao of Wellness changed my life. Awesome. Well, you look good. (laughs) (laughs) Weren't we talking about accepting a compliment? Accepting a compliment, exactly. But I just want people to know the reality because it's like, again, you see a picture, you see a reel, whatever, and you don't know the story behind it. And Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to get on my podcast and hopefully one day soon I will and be like, this is what I'm doing. This is what we're doing. We're getting up at this time. (laughs) We're walking, you know, like people love that. They love that. People want to be told what to do. When it comes to this, I cannot tell you what to do at this current (laughs) present moment in time. And that's wellness. Sometimes you have to figure it out for yourself. (laughs) And yeah, like tying it back to the beginning, different things work at different times. I've definitely been in times in my life, even right before I got the Botox and got sick, 
I had so much energy. I was doing BBG, which people think that I hate. No, it's high intensity plyometric workouts, 28 minutes. I had so much energy. I was doing them like three, four times a week. I was going on long walks. That was working for me at that time. And hopefully I'll get back, you know, where I can find something that I can be consistent with. But again, it's like, well, for me is not necessarily like, what are my workouts? What is my diet? Am I meditating? <laughs> like, what is the state of my body? It's my mindset. It's like accepting, like, this is just what it is right now. And despite that, like, I'm good. You're good. Yeah. So jumping back to relationships a little bit. How did you start dating again post-divorce? I'm, I'm thinking what they're asking is they probably just <laughs> left their relationship, got a divorce. And it's not funny, sorry, but they're just sorry trying to figure your, out yeah. how to date again afterwards. I think that this really depends on the circumstances. And for me, again, I feel like I've talked about this a lot. But for me, by the time I got divorced, that was just the final action to be taken. Really, a lot of the emotional stuff happened way prior to that divorce actually happening. So when we did get divorced and I moved out, I did not feel like shell shocked, I think, like a lot of people feel. Um, I definitely went through that, but long before the divorce actually happened. So for me personally, I was kind of in a place where I was open. I definitely did not think that I was going to be dating or at least dating seriously. I was not looking for a relationship, <laughs> like none of that. However, I was introduced to this person who I had been introduced to two years prior when I was separated through a mutual friend. And we happened to be in the same place at the same time. Neither of us expected anything. We had lunch and it was just the perfect fit. And I resisted and resisted because I thought that I should be single for X amount of time after getting divorced before I get into another relationship. But again, this kind of comes back to the individuality thing that we're like kind of alluding to here with the wellness stuff. It's so different for everybody. I don't think that there's any appropriate amount of time to wait or appropriate amount of time to like jump in. I think that it really just depends on you and how you're feeling. And, you know, I was like, oh, I have this amazing person. And I kept <laughs> saying to him like, well, I don't know if I can be in a relationship. And I've probably shared this, but he was like, look, if you need to go to Bali for six months and like do your eat, pray, love and find yourself, do it. I'll be here. And then I was like, mm, I don't want to like let this good one get away. I hear so many nightmare stories and he is such a gem that I just finally opened myself up to like what was really happening and stopped having arbitrary rules around it. And I was ready. That said, had I been in this marriage and the divorce kind of came out of nowhere or if it, or it was very traumatic or something like that, I don't think that I would have been ready. So I think that it really just depends on circumstances. I don't know if this person is asking how, like, where do you meet men? All of that. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think they're more so asking how to start dating, like maybe how to heal after the divorce so that they can be prepared and date again for the next person. Mm -hmm. So they're ready for them. I don't know. Cause I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you're saying Just kidding. you were already emotionally and mentally. So, so something that I did when I was in the marriage, it's no secret, you know, that we were having issues. We separated in 2022 and I did a lot of work in therapy and a lot of work in recovery. And the work that I did was I took him completely out of the equation because I would complain to people. He's he, this, he, that he doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. He won't do this. He's doing that. And especially in the recovery part of my life, the people who I was, you know, consulting with were like, oh, we don't care. We don't care what he's doing or not doing. What are you doing and what are you not doing? And I had to really look at my own shit. And when I was really in the thick of it and really looking at his behavior and really focusing on him, I was instructed to do things for him. So when I wanted to 
leave, you know, pull the trigger on the whole thing. I was told to make him his coffee in the morning, bring it to him, do the exact opposite of what I wanted to do. And, you know, I think that I walked away from that feeling like I had tried everything and we really did try everything. We did therapy and he was working on things himself. I was working on things myself. I looked at my patterns and relationships. I saw patterns that I hadn't seen before all the way back to when he and I got together. So, you know, I think that although it's painful, we tend to hyper focus on the other person and what we were getting or not getting. And really, you're going to bring yourself into the next relationship. And I feel like if you do not take inventory of your part and look at your own stuff and try to change whatever it is, because we all have a part in something, maybe not, you know, if it's an abusive situation, something like that, obviously there's a spectrum here, but it's like wherever you go, there you are. You're going to bring yourself into the next relationship. So look at your own shit and see where you can improve. And another thing that I did years ago in recovery was I wrote down my ideal partner and I was like, great, I'm going to write down everything. And then they're going to like magically appear. And I did the exercise and this person said, great, now you go out there and you be that. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. But you know, it kind of goes back to like, you attract what you are, that kind of thing, like put out what you want to receive. So I try to do that too. This is so roundabout. I don't even know if I answered that question, but I would say like, look at your own part because that's what you can control. And you don't want to bring the same thing into the next relationship that you're in because you're just going to repeat the cycle. And once you feel like you have some awareness around that, then I would say, you know, maybe you're ready to go out and date. There you go. All about accountability. Yeah. So with that being said, would you get married again? For sure. Ooh. Ooh. I'm traditional in that way. Okay. And I didn't feel like my last experience like turned me off of marriage or anything. Yes. I saw it as a really positive experience overall. And my parents have been together for 52 years and it's just something that I value. That said, I'm not like trying to <laughs> rush down the aisle or anything like that, but for sure I would get married again. I love that. I love that you said that. That means you're in a really great relationship too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Chris, uh, if you're watching this, uh -oh. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we'll send it to him. All right. <laughs> so now that we're speaking about relationships and getting married again, someone asked, what advice would you give to someone who is bored in their relationship, but they're scared to leave? <laughs> someone who's bored in the relationship and they're scared to leave. I would kind of say what I said about dating. Somebody told me once, cause I was complaining of being bored. I can't remember why. But she said, Ariel, only boring people get bored. <laughs> <laughs> Accountability. And I was like, that's a little mean, but <laughs> OK. <laughs> and now I love it. And again, it's so hard to say without context what to do. But it goes back to what I was saying before, like maybe take your partner out of the equation and look at your own stuff and see if there's anything that you could be doing. If it's a otherwise good relationship, but you're just feeling kind of like blah, which all relationships go through those phases, by the way. See if there's anything that you could be doing to add value to the relationship or make it more interesting. And I think that that's what we can control. We can't control other people. We can control ourselves. We can control our reactions. Sometimes we can control our actions and we can control what we give and put into something. And if you do that and you're still feeling like it's just not fulfilling in whatever kind of way, then I would say life is too short <laughs> and go find your person. You're so in love. I love it. <laughs> you can just tell. Really? <laughs> yes. Just because you have so many positive things to say about relationships oh. and everything. And sometimes when people are feeling down in that oh. area, then they don't have that many positive yeah. things to say. And plus... He just came back from vacation, so that might, you know, help. He's just the best. Oh, it's I like love it. The best. Yeah. Okay, so has your opinion changed on um, age gaps in relationships? 
Yes and no. There was more to this question that I saw that I don't think it's in your questions, Mm -hmm. but the person who asked it said that she was 39 and considering dating somebody in their 50s. And I'm 39 and the person I'm dating is in his 50s. Mm -hmm. So I do feel like I came away from my previous marriage with a little bit more of an understanding of the nuances of being in an age gap relationship. So I think when the age gap is like 20, 30 years, it is difficult. Even if it's not difficult in the beginning, it gets more difficult, which might sound really obvious to everybody listening. But for me, like when I started dating my ex, there was a huge age gap, but we had so many similar things that we shared. We shared a life together. We shared in new experiences. We were both younger, so it just was not really an issue. And then, you know, we started growing and we started growing in different ways as a result of our ages. And we weren't sharing all of those things that we shared in the beginning. So then it was just this big chasm, I would say. So that's a big age gap, but it didn't turn me off from dating anybody older than me. I've always been attracted to people who are a little bit older than me. And, you know, my grandparents on my mom's side were 16 years apart and not to be morbid, but she died before him. Mm. And I think you just never know. So if it's really amazing in so many other ways, and then there's just an age gap, I think you just never know. Like, it's not something that would make me think twice about dating somebody. I think you just need to be aware of how things might look in 5, 10, 15 years, because even with a 10 year age gap, and I see this in people that I know, it's all fun and games. And then when it's 70 and 80 or 80 and 90, and if it's the woman who's younger, like suddenly you're in completely different places and a healthy 80 year old can want to be like doing things and traveling all the time. And the 90 year old can't, but that's life too. So you need to weigh a lot of different variables and just go into it, like making an informed decision. Okay. So let's move into fashion and beauty and all that good stuff. How do you find your personal style? There is a stylist, Alison Bornstein, and I don't know if she came up with this. I think she did, but she has this like three word theory. So you have three words and one of them is kind of like the overarching and then the other two are kind of like subcategories. And these are things that you want to encompass in your style. And then I think that like Pinterest is a really great resource for this. And you can literally put in like elevated casual style, you know, and you can just start like pinning things and getting ideas that way. And that is my, (laughs) that is my advice for that. How would you describe your style then? Oh, I would say elevated, casual, quiet luxury. (laughs) Love. You look beautiful today, by the way. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) We're learning how to accept compliments here. (laughs) Right. I was was testing you there. No, I know. (laughs) Okay, so what products or beauty services do you swear by that aren't hard or expensive to maintain? I would say first and foremost is a good skincare routine, which can be expensive depending on what skincare you're using. But I think that there's such an emphasis on things like lasers. Everyone wants to know what's the laser? What's the gadget? What's the in-office procedure? What are we doing? And those can all be great. But what's really going to have the biggest impact is what you were doing on a daily basis. So I think finding and sticking to a skincare routine that works for you can make all of the difference. And I think that if you find a skincare routine that really works for you, then you don't have to do services and don't have to use extra products and things or do things that require a lot of maintenance. The other thing that I would say that I've been doing and loving that is not expensive is taping my face. (laughs) Taping my face at night with this Japanese face tape, Natural Skincare Bible on Instagram. I think I've talked about it on the podcast before. It's really soft tape and it doesn't irritate. It's not like other brands where it's like hard, kind of like paper mache (laughs) cast on your face. You can do your skincare, you can put it over. And I have found, because I'm on my no Botox journey and it's been a year and people don't believe me. So. (laughs) (laughs) 
you can see no Botox. I do notice when I don't use it that I have more like fine lines around my eyes and a little bit in my forehead when I wake up. So I wear it when I sleep. And when I wake up, my skin is like ice skating rink smooth. It just keeps things in place. We move our faces at night when we sleep and we don't realize it. And then also like I'm a face side sleeper. So my face like smushes and the tape just keeps it from doing that. I just do three strips down on my forehead and then like one little one on each side of my eye. It's not expensive. It comes with like four rolls and I've been on one roll for like months now. So I feel like that's a really good inexpensive hack. Even if you're doing Botox, I feel like it would help to prolong it because if you're doing Botox and then you're like sleeping on your side and you're scrunching that whole area up, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like it could be a nice cherry on top. Good to know. All right. So uh, the next question is, do you compare your body now that implants are removed? Do I compare my body? Not really. When I first got my implants out, I did a little bit. Not in like a negative way, though. I actually like my natural (laughs) boobs as well. Sometimes I miss the look of the implant just because it really does (laughs) give you this confidence boost. And I was never a boob girl. I never cared. I like a small model boob. I like high fashion. I like how it looks with smaller boobs. But when I had bigger boobs with the implants, I was like, whoa, new level of confidence unlocked. I don't know why, but no, I don't really, I don't really compare. I'm happy with how things are right now. Love it. And one of the good things, and I may have said this before about being so overwhelmed and having so much on my plate is that I don't think about any of that shit anymore. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I was actually talking to Chelsea, my brand manager the other day and you know, Chelsea. Yes. And there was this procedure that I was like, thinking about getting and she was like are you going to get it because I'm people are going to wonder now she asked if I was going to get it because she's trying to schedule things and she was like do you need like a few days and I was like Chelsea I have too many responsibilities right now (laughs) to be getting procedures like (laughs) and I was like whoa who is this person because before like again I had all of that minutia taken care of for me all I had to worry about was like doing my job but everything else I could do whatever I wanted. Mm -hmm. So I could like go get a boob job and have three weeks, you know, to do absolutely nothing because I didn't have to, well, I was separated when I did that, but like you get what I'm saying. You didn't have to heal. Everything was taken care of for me. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, it just, it was different. (laughs) Got it. So I saw on your TikTok, you had CO2 under your eyes. And so someone asked, about the easy gel and CO2 under eye update. What's going on there? I did an update on my Patreon. So that's just a plug for my Patreon. (laughs) Smart. (laughs) Had to find a way to work that in. If you guys like solo episodes, though, my Patreon is a weekly solo episode every Saturday morning. And it's like the tea. It's like the behind the scenes of my life. And I am going to be doing more solos with the regular show. So don't go complain in the reviews that I'm saving the good stuff for patreon behind a paywall no it's just extra content anyway that said so when i did co2 i did it with jen and jen hollander at cupid lips and we did it on like a wednesday i think and my boyfriend's birthday was that weekend (laughs) we had a lot of things planned and i had continued to push it off because every time we had it scheduled i was like oh shoot i'm like in the studio the next day so anyway we went really light with the co2 and for maybe like two days i was swollen and i loved it absolutely loved the swelling and then i had a little bit of redness but i didn't really crust i didn't really flake like with you know typical co2 and i'm probably about that was july 21st so six weeks out i don't really know if i notice a difference because i'm not like taking progress photos or looking every day. I have nothing really to compare it to. So not sure about that one. And then we were going to do easy gel, which is basically like a filler used from your body's own. I want to say plasma. I could be wrong. And I haven't done that either, (laughs) but I do plan to, and I will update you when I do. Nice. Nice. (laughs) All right. So lastly, wrapping everything up, (laughs) What are you excited about? 
a few things. I'm really excited about the rebrand and I'm not just saying that, you know, yes, this has been a whole, not a whole year, but we've been working on it from the beginning of the year. We were going to launch in May and then we pulled it back and changed the direction a little bit, but I'm just excited. I feel like it's a good time to do it. You know, five years in, especially after the year that I had, I feel like a completely different person. And while it's going to be the same show, I think that we're just really leveling up. We have so many good guests coming this fall. Like, I think we have 12 episodes already recorded. And it's like, I can't decide which one I want to put when because they're all so good. So I know you guys are going to love it. And it's really, really qualified, amazing people in fields like health, beauty, all of the things that you guys love. And of course, solo episodes. So I hope that you guys are excited too. And because we changed the name and everything of the podcast, make sure that you are subscribed so that you don't miss an episode. We are continuing to do every Wednesday episodes and there will be a few Monday episodes sprinkled here and there. So if you are subscribed, you will not miss any of those. And if you haven't, already done so, please rate and review. It makes a huge difference, especially with the new show. We want to bump it up there in the algorithm and get the word out. You guys can share on social media. Make sure you're following us at the new Instagram handle, which is well.pod. And there's lots of fun content there and ways to engage with the community. And that's it. Love ya.